That's a good girl. Hello everyone and welcome back to another outdoor adventure. In fact, this is going to be two for the price of one because I'll be showing not only one of my regular forays around the local bushlands, but also a recent field trip to the Glasshouse Mountains. So without further ado, let's get started. Brisbane is interspersed with numerous bushland reserves. Some small, others quite expansive. These islands of wilderness flanked on all sides by suburbia are excellent places within which to behold a taste of some of the country's fascinating creatures. Among them, a group of spiders that are, in the most literal sense, a household name in Australia. Right, oh hello there. Oh you fucker. Hi. Gotcha. That, I mean, it's, I don't think she's I don't know why I'm making those noises. I don't think this, are you kidding me? I don't think this spider, is, uh, really mate? This is getting very, very, this is, this is ridiculous. Okay, look, I don't think this spider is adult, but it is quite a fair size. I think it's a female. Yeah, there we go. That wasn't too hard now, was it? Yeah, this definitely does look female to me. And so it's a species that needs very little introduction on this channel. This is Holconia imanus, the giant banded huntsman. Oh, and there's a plane flying overhead. Great. Yeah, no, this, everything is just going flawlessly to plan right now. <laughs> but Holconia imanus is one of the more common huntsmen that you'll find in this area. And it's also one of the biggest in the country. One of the characteristic features of this species is this thick black stripe that runs part way down the dorsal surface of the opis opisthosoma, which is essentially just a fancy term for abdomen. Yeah, look who's calmed down now, huh? That's a good girl. Okay, so off you pop. That was... Oh, and, and uh, first you were moving too much and now you're just flat out refusing to move. You really know how to grind my gears, don't you? <laughs> there we go. Fairly large Holconia emanus. I think it's another female. I don't believe this spot is mature. But I'd say at most it's maybe one or two molts of maturity. Holconia imanus is very much a familiar face on this channel, and it fits as it's arguably the most iconic of Australia's marvellous assortment of huntsmen, a recurring feature in countless viral Australian spider posts. But there's more to Aussie arachnids than these impressive spiders. Huntsman spiders are something that I dare say almost everyone in Australia would be very well acquainted with. But there are other arachnids here that, while iconic and almost notorious overseas, very few people in this country even know that we have them. And in order to stand a good chance of finding one of those, we need to look not beneath the bark of trees, but under rocks. Globally, scorpions are the most dangerous arachnids on the planet in terms of annual human fatalities outclassing spiders by an enormous margin. But here in Australia, these ancient hunters are comparatively benign, with not one of the numerous species found all over the country being venomous enough to directly kill a person. And these Hormurus, widespread and common throughout eastern Queensland's forests, are pretty much as harmless as scorpions get. I think we, we've got three scorpions under the same log. Okay, you just stay there for a second. There's also a couple little babies here. Very tiny as well. I look, at that, look at that next there, to my there, finger. There, there, there. Wait, wait, wait. Oh my god. 
Oh my god, look at that! Oh, they're absolutely adorable. Right, now where is the big fella? This may or may not be their mother. It, it, it is a female, it does look like a female. You can see no notch in the... Jesus Christ, mate. So yeah, this scorpion does look like a female, there's no notch in the pincers there. So it's very possible that this individual is the... Well, it's like this entire forest is just conspiring to interrupt my recordings. Shall I proceed with what I was doing before? What was I even talking about? Ah, um, yeah, the scorpion that's sitting right in my hand. Yeah, okay. So it is very possible that the little babies that were under the log with this girl could well be her offspring. And like all scorpions, they exhibit some pretty extensive parental care. They give live birth and will carry their babies atop their backs until they develop to the point that they are ready to fend for themselves. Alright, I'm just going to put you back. Uh, can you get off me, please? Hormurus are rather secretive animals. Their flattened bodies perfect for wedging themselves into the tight, confined spaces beneath rocks and logs within which they are safe from the many sharp-eyed predators that abound during the daylight hours. This also means that they exist largely unbeknownst to the many hikers and trail runners that pass through their habitat on the daily, much to their benefit, I'd suspect. But for anyone searching in the right places, these scorpions can reveal themselves to be shockingly abundant. Hormurus are something I've long had a sort of sentimental attachment to. One was my first ever pet scorpion, back in the sixth grade. And now, even after finding countless individuals in situ, I doubt I will ever grow tired of seeing them. Ooh, young Holconia who's skipping. <laughs> yeah, I really like your dance moves there, mate. Really, fu really funny. It's probably Holconia emanus, but the distinctive patterning that they gain as they mature hasn't become especially apparent yet. It's also, I think, the first whole cornea I've ever seen under a log. And yes, this is a this is a log. It was just flipped up. Bit of an intro my shadow. Bit of an interesting combination here. We've got another young Hormurus, not quite as tiny as the last ones. And then uh, my shadow. Uh, really? And then, seriously focus. And then this curious little critter. Like the scorpion, which it is getting very, very close to, it is an arachnid. This is a type of velvet mite. Velvet mites form a family known as the Trombidiidae. They are fairly diminutive animals, typically less than a centimetre long. But in the minuscule world of mites, Trombidians are nothing short of behemoths. This rather attractively patterned individual is possibly a member of the genus Ronaldothrombium. And velvet mites are not the only crit and velvet mites are not the only critters here that are named after their velvety texture. Both a good find and a not so good find. It's a deceased velvet worm and the first wild velvet worm I have seen in years. But yeah, I would have been happier to see it in better shape than this. A um, disabled juvenile Holconia imanis. 
but in spite of its handicaps, it is still able to move around exceptionally well. And of course, since this spider is a juvenile, it will be molting several times until, what is it? Oh, oh, is that Pormacephalus again? Oh my god! Hey, okay. Okay, so, so sorry Mr. Disabled Huntsman, I wish I could pay more attention to you, but there's something else here. Oh, I see it, I see it. Okay, I don't have any real plans of keeping this centipede, but given how skittish and jumpy they are, this is pretty much the only way that I'm able to get any remotely decent footage. But this appears to be the undescribed tree-dwelling Hormocephalus species that I found in my previous upload. And that last one that I found was actually the first one I had ever seen. So to find two in a row is really quite a shock. The centipede does bear quite a strong superficial resemblance to Scolopendra morsitans. But of course, it isn't. It belongs to a completely separate genus. And like I said the last time I featured it, this is an undescribed species. So it does not have a proper binomial name, nor a formal description. And it appears to be pretty much exclusively arboreal, being found beneath the loose bark of eucalypt trees, similarly to many huntsmen. Well, it went somewhere there. It's no secret that I love animals. The creepier and cruelier, the better. But the natural world boasts many wonders beyond spiders, scorpions and centipedes. Beyond the bounds of the animal kingdom, indeed. And this is where we come to the second adventure. A recent field trip to the Glasshouse Mountains, a roughly one and a half hour drive north of Brisbane. And I was there to study not the animals, but the vast and varied array of plants that call this region home. Here there are great expanses of coastal heath, at first glance a relatively nondescript biome that, upon closer examination, is home to a kaleidoscopic assortment of botanical wonders. Coastal heaths are rather poor in nutrient, and large trees are consequently rare. In the absence of forest cover, these habitats are the domain of smaller plants. Rising above their tufted grass-like foliage, the glamorous purple blooms of Soabia juncia are a frequent sight on the sandy soils. Rivaling them in beauty, Patasonia sericea, a close relative of the iris, and Boronia falsifolia, a small shrub named after its curved sickle-shaped leaflets, the prefix falci stemming from the Latin falsus meaning sickle, and the suffix folium referring to the leaves. Like many Boronia species, the flowers possess four petals, arranged in a star-like manner. Xanthoria, among the most iconic plants in Australia, are a frequent sight here. Despite the common name grass tree, they are neither grasses nor trees, but distant relatives of lilies. Their stems are protected by the densely clumped bases of innumerable dead leaves, forming a thick, hard covering. The shortage of soil-borne nutrients in coastal heaths not only restricts the size of the plants that grow there, it has also driven some species to find alternative means by which to gain nourishment. Many different plant lineages across the globe resort to parasitism to varying extents. Some, like this dendropthe, a type of mistletoe, parasitise trees but still possess green leaves and are thus capable of manufacturing nutriment for themselves via photosynthesis. Others, however, barely even do that. Entwined around many of the shrubs in the heathland are the cryptic vines of Cathasa glabella, 
one of several vines that are obligate plant parasites. Cassitha are entirely leafless, and thus much more reliant on nutrients taken from other plants. Their green stems do still possess chlorophyll, and they are thus able to manufacture some nourishment through photosynthesis. Though once they have established themselves upon a suitable host, chlorophyll production is reduced or halted, and the stems lose their green coloration. Cassitha are sometimes erroneously called dodder, though the actual dodders form a separate genus, with the superficial resemblance between the two genera being a result of convergent evolution. The nutrient deficiency of heathland soils has driven other plants to obtain nourishment via means perhaps even more radical than plant parasitism. On the ground, especially along the verges of walking tracks, there are an abundance of small, glistening red tufts, like gemstones left abandoned in the sand. Upon closer inspection, they reveal themselves to be tiny plants, sundews. These are Drosera spatulata, so named because of the species' spoon-shaped leaves. But the beauty of these miniature scarlet rosettes shrouds a deadly trap, for these plants derive much of their nourishment from the bodies of animals. The countless droplets that adorn the surface of the leaves may seem like little more than dew, glimmering softly and harmlessly beneath the sunlight but they are in fact incredibly sticky, as any unfortunate insect that lands atop these innocuous looking plants will soon discover. There does, however, come a time for truce. Drosera, like most flowering plants, are pollinated by insects, and to lessen the risk of killing their own pollinators, their flowers are borne aloft by a tall stem, holding them well above the lethal traps below. Little do their insect pollinators know that they are, in a very literal way, setting seed to the grisly demise of their own descendants as they partake in the formation of a new generation of carnivorous plants. That brings an end to this video. Hope you enjoyed seeing not only the usual features on this channel, but some of Australia's botanical wonders as well. If you want to see more of my outdoor adventures, check out this playlist here. And if you enjoy my content, feel free to subscribe as well. Thank you all very much for watching. That is it from me, and I shall see you again very soon.